You're in the water loop. <laughs> Welcome to Waterloop, the podcast exploring solutions for sustainability and equity in water. I'm the host, Travis Loop. This is episode number 188, The Sport of Sustainability. Sports have tremendous influence and impact on many facets of society, including the environment. The potential to turn the sports industry into a powerful driver of sustainability led to the formation of the Green Sports Alliance in 2010. Over a decade later, its member teams, leagues, venues, and businesses are creating change. As discussed in this episode with Dune Ives, the organization's co-founder and a board member. Dune explains how the Green Sports Alliance was initially focused on energy and waste, but that water is now becoming a more prominent issue. She talks about a new playbook that aims to help venues improve water management and the opportunities for the water and sports industries to deepen collaboration. Before starting the episode, I want to quickly mention that Waterloop is a nonprofit media outlet that depends on its supporters. This episode was made possible by Open Water. Open Water is ultra purified, electrolyte packed, canned water in BPA free aluminum packaging. Recyclable? Check. Climate neutral? You bet. And they even encourage you to fill up at the tap whenever possible. One of my favorite things about open water is it is made in the U.S. and shipped from dozens of warehouses to minimize transportation emissions. Check them out at drinkopenwater.com and pick up a can at a store near you. You're in the water loop. So we are here at the Green Sports Alliance summit in Seattle. I'm here thanks to you really kind of pulling me into this world. Grateful for it. Uh, Green Sports Alliance, what is it? First of all, I'm thrilled that you're here oh. because we need more of this cross-industry integration yeah. if we're really, really going to advance progress on water. Yeah. So I, I am thrilled, Travis, that you're here. Waterloop, you're here, and you're <laughs> experiencing Green Sports Alliance, and you're seeing it for what it really is. It's awesome. Yeah. It's good. And I've wanted to connect with the Green Sports Alliance since like 2012, probably, when I was at EPA in DC and heard about it. And I was like, that's so cool. And I just didn't have the time bandwidth, whatever to drill in. So 10 years later, you know, here we are. Yeah, well, fast forward. So we actually started 13 years ago here in Seattle. Okay. So this summit, we're bringing it back home, which is amazing for all of us who started here. Yeah. Um, and, and the Green Sports Alliance now is well over 300 member organizations large. We have every single professional sports league represented. Mm. We actually have some of the league uh, leaders here. We have uh, so all professional leagues. We have NCAA, we have NASCAR, Mm. we have PGA. We've got representatives from World Cup from FIFA are here, LA 28 for Olympic and Paralympics. And that really was the dream is that we would galvanize a collaborative environment for sports and entertainment venue managers, Mm. operators, owners, developers, designers, vendors to come together and to share what they know so that together we can really advance progress on our environmental and social issues much more quickly. Why kind of target the sports world? Why try to put your arms around the sports world and steer them in that direction? So sports is that one thing that connects all of us around the world, Mm. right? We all have had an experience where Maybe we've just run in a foot race, like a 1K or whatever the smallest race is yeah. somebody can run in, right? Even elementary school, we've all competed and we've all had that sense of that, that drive, mm. that competitive drive. And so sports just became this natural place for us to turn to if we wanted to evolve the conversation around sustainability, right? Because sports teams by themselves are competitive. Mm. Mm. Um, and our working thesis was if we get these competitive groups to mm. come together, maybe they'll compete with one another yeah. and they'll try to see who has the lowest rate of waste, right? mm. who has the highest recycling content, who has the most power generated from renewable resources. And that's really what happened in the first few years. But the other reason why sports is these sports venues, so stadiums and arenas, they really are anchor institutions within communities. Mm. They have gigantic footprints. In, in and of themselves, they are small cities. 
And it's really where a lot of the sustainability conversations, I think, come together. Mm. Right? So you've got people, you've got community, you have vendors, whole supply chains that make this possible, air transportation, public transportation, water, waste, energy. So we felt like, gosh, if we could advance the sustainability conversation through sports, mm. think of all of the market actors and all of the people that we could reach. Yeah. I always, when I think about making progress on the environment, I always think about the, the role and the power of like the private sector, yeah. the business world. Yeah. And sports is like huge business, right? Multi-billion dollar franchises, athletes making hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that's a lot of power too, when you can get like that, that those big businesses behind mm -hmm. this. They have so much ability to make change, mm -hmm. you know? They do. Um, water. But, but what you yeah, just yeah. said is, 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 is really the point. Okay. They're businesses mm -hmm. and businesses have to make money. Mm. And so how can you integrate sustainability into a business setting, into a conversation where the return on investment is front and center, right? You've got sponsorships that are worth multi-millions of dollars and you have a whole new fan base with expectations about the experience that they're going to have when they come to a venue like this, like yeah. Climate Pledge Arena. So it really all does come down to return on investment. And I think that's what this group of Green Sports Alliance members has done so well over the years is they've proven it out time and again. Mm. We've heard at Summit this week, the case to be made for $4 million worth of naming rights on a building because of sustainability. So it, it's advanced to the point where, you know, I think we can look back and say, gosh, we've had an impact with Green Sports Alliance, but there's a whole heck of a lot more to be done. I mean, you, I think this is like the most attendance you've had at a summit too, right? So that's showing there's a trajectory going here that's really exciting. Many countries, multiple countries, not just the U.S., yeah. not just North America. Sure. But we have folks from, we have an entire Japanese delegation. Uh, we have folks from Argentina, Switzerland, the U.K., all over the world mm. who are coming here to share and coming here to learn. Yeah. So when you talk about sustainability in sports, there's a lot of different angles to that, right? There's the carbon emissions and the climate impact. There's the waste reduction from all everything at the venues and stuff. And I think about water. <laughs> well, water's what's on my mind. At water loop? Yeah, water? what do you know? Um, I'm curious about like where water sits within that portfolio of sustainability and how that's, you know, what direction it's going. I get the sense that it's rising up very recently, mm -hmm. kind of in the priority list. But yeah, I love your perspective mm -hmm. on that. When we started the Green Sports Alliance, we were really focused on waste mm -hmm. and energy. Mm -hmm. That's That was it, waste and energy. And water was kind of out here, you know, as part of the conversation. But in many, most places uh, around the country, these arenas and stadiums don't pay the same amount for water and for uh, wastewater mm. as they do for energy and as they do for hauling waste out. Those were also the easiest areas for the teams to really focus on because that's really where sustainability I think started from is mm. a conversation around energy consumption, renewable energy and, and waste reduction and trying to get our recycling rates up. So it was natural for us to start there. But even though we didn't have a very specific and intentional focus on water, we have a lot of stadiums and a lot of arenas that have made incredible progress on water. So I think now is water's time in sports and entertainment venues. Yay. <laughs> I'll cheer for that. I'm a fan. <laughs> um, the wave has crested. Yeah, so let's, let's keep going with the water ponds. But yeah, that's what I, I mean, I kind of observe. This is my first summit. Mm -hmm. I just observe from the conversation uh, that water has risen up um, and is it becoming on people's minds a little more. Yes. You've got all the conditions out west. I say, because I don't like to call it a drought, this is climate change, it's permanent aridification in these places. Uh, and you've got just different issues in, play in other parts of the US, water's a bigger deal. Um, and so it's coming up on people's minds. Uh, I'm fascinated by the Atlanta Falcons Stadium, the Mercedes-Benz Mercedes Stadium, yeah. and how much uh, stormwater they're capturing and holding and releasing. I, I've got to get over there and see that. Uh, so it's exciting what's happening out there for sure. You'll be really impressed with Target Fields oh. as well in Minnesota. Okay. 
they had one of the first water reclamation projects in place. Mm -hmm. And and I think they'll be the first to tell you. And I, and I think this is the water conversation we're starting right now is, is it had they thought about water from the beginning of the design of mm -hmm. the facility like Mercedes Benz has, right? This is the leapfrog approach that we're seeing here. Mercedes Benz has, has, has had a leapfrog effect from Target Fields experience. Had Target Field started with water in design, mm -hmm. then they wouldn't be experiencing some of the growing pains that they're having. Sure. So our goal right now at the Green Sports Alliance is to get water integrated into the design process right from the very beginning, right? Yeah. So think about the entire footprint of a venue. And and I um I, I recently learned, and this was a mind-blowing thing for me. <laughs> and I don't know how to explain it with any kind of equations or formulas or even data to back it up, but sports and entertainment venues are the single largest generator of stormwater in any city. Wow. That's that right there is worth a big conversation. We don't have pervious pavement everywhere, mm. right? So the water that's running off of these buildings is running onto the sidewalks, into the streets, carrying with it all sorts of toxins that are then going out to the Puget Sound. Yeah. And here in Washington State to the Salish Sea, to our larger ecosystem, where it's affecting fish, it's affecting orca, it's affecting everything that is supposed to be thriving in these waters. Sure. So I, I, think, I think we have this really important moment right now to start that conversation about water mm. and to give these venues some tools, some case studies, some examples where they can be inspired and they can learn from others that have come before them. Yeah. I mean, we're here in the Climate Pledge Arena and they have one of the coolest water sustainability features where they're capturing the rain from the roof, right? And using it to make the ice for the NHL team. I mean, that is, I'm such a geek, how excited I get about that. Um, <laughs> And I do also want to mention uh, my football team, the Washington Commanders, are going to be building a new stadium. Th thank you. Yeah, okay. They're right. going to be building a new stadium in the next <laughs> bunch of years. Uh -huh. And so I'm hoping that's an opportunity mm -hmm. for that leapfrog. Well, I'm just calling them out right now, <laughs> guys. Make make it sustainable. See, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry yeah, yeah, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> but we, I, so I'm I'm really excited that one of the Green Sports Alliance teammates, Michael Krause, led development of a playbook called uh, "Playing or Building for the Next Generation," okay. which is is really trying to center water in that conversation of if you have a retrofit that you're trying to do on an existing building, like they did here with Climate Pledge Arena. It used to be Key Arena. Mm. Um, and then, or if you're designing a new facility, like it sounds like your yeah. team is yeah. going to be doing, how do you center water right, right from the very beginning? So you're really thinking about this venue as a watershed. I That's like what that. it is, yeah. right? It yeah. may not be the watershed that we envision, but it, but it is, it's producing water. It's interacting with water. It's using water. It's polluting water. Maybe it's not polluting water. Maybe it's filtering water. But in and of itself, it's starting to act as a watershed. So how do how do we help to inform the new design of that building sure. where you live? Well, to that point, here at the Green Sports Alliance Summit, uh, a new water playbook was just released. Yes. And I would love to hear uh, what that is. Yeah. So, Travis, you and I met when... <laughs> I was working at the U.S. Water Alliance. Right, right. I call this like my massive internship <laughs> in everything related to water. And I, I walked away from that experience wanting to take what I had learned at the U.S. Water Alliance and apply it to this organization where water really wasn't a conversation that everybody was talking about yet. Mm -hmm. So I pitched it to our CEO. I'm on the board of the Green Sports Alliance. I'm also a co-founder of the Green Sports Alliance, but I don't just get to do anything I want to do. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working on it, but I don't get to do anything I want to do yet. Um, so I pitched it to Roger and said, I feel like now is water's time. Mm -hmm. We're bringing Green Sports Alliance to Seattle, even though we don't have I'm fascinated by Lake Tulare in California. Oh, right. We have an extra lake now, right. you know, up in Washington State. We do have some really significant water issues here. So let's, let's, where we feel like we're awash with water and we aren't always, let's, let's start the conversation mm. where water helps produce all of our power. Mm. 
right? And where we have pretty significant forest fires because of mm. drought conditions that we experience, not enough water for our, our, our forests. Mm -hmm. um, so we created the first ever water playbook for sports and entertainment venues. We call it all sports or water sports. Mm. Love it. Because without water, the game cannot go on. No. Every single sporting event requires water, some more so than others. Mm -hmm. So it's not intended to be a full toolkit, mm -hmm. right? It's not, you're not going to look at this and say, here's how I can operationalize something. But it's really intended to provide a baseline understanding for everybody of what water is, how buildings interact with water, what you should know about water, and some resources and some key strategies to work through to make sure that your venue can be a leader in water stewardship. Yeah, so it's, we just launched it and I'm so glad you're here for it. Yeah, very exciting. And it's got it, like you said, it's got a great list of resources. Yes. That's key, right? Is like always, here's the big concepts, here's the, here's the way you should go, here's places to find out how to do it. That's right. And case studies, like look at how they did it in Atlanta or uh, other fun places, Manchester City, like the big soccer. Yeah, I can't say soccer. Dallas. They're football route football. now, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Premier League team, another uh, capturing water off the roof, making a beer with it, reigning champions, fun things like that too. But congrats on getting that water playbook out. Uh, Thank you. And you made a great point uh, about it being. It's like a living document, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to keep evolving and expanding. Yeah, it will. I mean, I just I just had somebody from the National uh, Water Reuse Association reach out today, and they said, "Hey, read the playbook. I really love it." I'm like, "Oh goodness, good. I read it again and tell me if there's anything we got wrong." <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> so, I'm we're certainly not experts in sure. water, but it's really intended to grow and evolve as we learn more from all of these venues, these sports and entertainment venues, mm. as they baseline their water consumption, as they look beyond some of the low hanging fruit, like mm. waterless urinals, as they consider opportunities around black water reclamation and reuse, as they think about community engagement mm. around watershed planning and ecosystem health and well-being, it will continue to evolve. Sure. Uh you know, you mentioned being at the U.S. Water Alliance and kind of working in that that side a little bit, right? The water utility side, if you will. I'm curious how the water sector and the sports industry, you know, how can they collaborate a little bit more? A, a big part of this audience is obviously the water side. What can they do to get more involved with with sports? So one of the cool things about these these venues is that they are the perfect intact environment where innovation can be tested out, right? So you've got a, like a perfect ecosystem. Yeah. If you've got a new technology or a new process, this is going to be the place to test it out. A living, breathing, breathing building, right? And it's a safe environment to do that. And so I think as the water sector continues to advance some of the, the innovations around technology, especially around water uh, capture, and water reuse. Mm. I think those two areas are kind of new within the sports and entertainment industry. I think there's tons of potential to partner with your local venue and test things out. I also think that there's a great opportunity for those in the, the trades or who want to get into the water sector to come into a venue like this, like Climate Pledge Arena, do an internship. Oh learn how they did the water reclamation and they turned the rainwater, the storm water into ice and then go off and get the job with the utility. Huh. So I think now we've got potentially a job training, a workforce development opportunity. But, but most importantly is every venue has a water challenge. Every utility has a water challenge. Mm. And so how can the utilities really start to evoke a one water mindset into the way that you t that venue operators and managers think about how to manage their water resources and how can utilities really support them in submetering, right? And really understanding where maybe there are water leaks, you're wasting water, um, or is there a, are there gonna be incentives that can come through the water utility that can really help the venue it's safe water, right? Sure. And maybe, you know, another idea is, I heard yesterday a lot about how much drinking water we're using to flush toilets. Right, exactly. In these venues. We're, we're flushing perfectly good drinking water, putting, putting drinking it into water. a toilet. Yeah. yeah, so 
how, how can a utility re really help to educate and inform these venues mm. so that they can be really good stewards of the fresh water and the potable water that we do have today? And we can work together to really help protect it in the future. You just used the phrase, the one water phrase, which is really something touted by the U.S. Water Alliance, yes. where you did your internship <laughs> quotes, uh, quotes around that. My deep uh, really, dive in the water really space. spent time with them, contributed on their their story. Uh, what what did you what else did you learn from that time? Um, you know, that that opened your eyes. I think the importance of centering equity in all of the water conversations. Mm. I think that was one of my biggest takeaways okay. from working at the Alliance. You know, I, I had no idea that there are over 2 million people in the U.S. that don't have access to mm. affordable, clean drinking water on a daily basis and sanitation. Yeah. And these venues don't either. So where there are venues, there are probably also water equity network teams. There are probably communities really getting engaged either by leveraging the money that's coming out of the EPA to support the infrastructure development that needs to happen and getting led out of lines, mm. um, or working on other issues that communities, that are a priority for communities. So I, I think that there's a potentially a great opportunity for these venues to be working more closely and learning from the communities about what really matters to them, what's important to them. I love that, how you just brought it all together. Uh, because I, and I saw this firsthand this week I went on the boat ride on the Duwamish River, and you have a community, an environmental justice community, where they, they're a Superfund location, right? And that community has been impacted by pollution. And now, I think it's the Seattle Kraken, the NHL team, is getting very involved with that Duwamish River coalition and trying to help however they can. And so there you've got the marriage of all of this coming, kind of coming together in a, in a positive way uh, for people. So that's right. We had a speaker yesterday who's, who kind of brought it home for me as well, saying that, you know, these venues are a refuge during really significant water events. The Superdome in New Orleans comes to Absolutely, mind for, right. after Katrina. Yeah. That's where you go to, to find protection mm -hmm. and shelter. And these venues also contribute negatively to these same communities. Mm -hmm. So hearing from the community what their needs and interests are, just like the Kraken have done for the Duwamish, mm -hmm. and then integrating that into the way that they think about managing the building, the operations of the building, the technology they integrate, the storytelling as well, and integrating integrating the messages from the community in exactly in the way the Kraken have. That The video that was shown oh, yeah. yesterday was really beautiful, wasn't it? It uh, was, absolutely. And you really got the sense too that there is a partnership built on trust. Mm -hmm that exists between those two. And I, I, I think a lot of people were inspired by that. I love that. And it's not just a one-off, right? Mm -hmm. Like that team is in the community for the long run. Mm -hmm. That community is obviously there. Yeah. And so there's a chance for long-term change kind of coming right. out of it. That's right. Dune, I feel like we could talk about uh, so many more things, but this has been an awesome conversation. Again, thank you for kind of pulling me into the Green Sports Alliance. I am happy to be part. I had a great experience here. I really encourage everybody to look it, look it up, follow on social media. But thank you so much. Thank you for everything. I'm like I'm tickled that you were here, and I can't wait to see what you do with all of this yeah. cross industry relationships and knowledge that come out of it. So thank you. Yeah, good point. There's a lot more water and sports stories on the way. Waterloo. Thanks for listening to the podcast, and thanks to Open Water, a supporter of Waterloo. To find all episodes, sign up for email updates, and connect on social media, visit waterloop.org. You're in the Waterloop. <laughs>